Hey, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Hey, Scott. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> it's always sunny at the workshop, right? <laughs> but you're very, uh, reality. I'm over it, too. This is much better. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Um, good weekend, hopefully. Decent. Hopefully all around, guys. Okay, good. Um, I might have a little Zoom bomber in a second. I apologize. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry for running a few minutes late here. Say hello. <laughs> Say hello. You want hello. To yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Heterogeneous effects of liberal institutions on economic development. <laughs> sorry. Um, it wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without kids and dogs. It really wouldn't. It really, really wouldn't. No, that's exactly. We have both actually in this room. This is fantastic. Awesome. Um, so. I don't want to. I don't want to keep us too long, guys. So I'll just do the maybe a really quick introduction. I know Gustavo, but were you going to kick things off as well, or were you, did you want me to? I'm 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 flexible. No, go go forty, go forty, Scott. That's that's okay. So let's let's keep the rules. <laughs> okay, okay. No, no, that's fine. No worries at all. Okay. Well, happy to do it. And again, apologies for the few minute delay here, but guys, we're we're very lucky and very excited to be welcoming um, David um, Sodonyate to the colloquium series today. Um, David is from the Department of Applied Economics at the University of Vigo, and his paper, Heterogeneous Effects of Liberal Institutions on Economic Development, the Role of Cultural Coherence with Formal Institutions, is frankly just fascinating. So we're really happy to help highlight it and your important work, David, um, and we're thrilled you can join us and welcome everybody else. Look forward to a, a great discussion. And uh, per usual, if you would like to chime in with questions in the chat, that's fine. When we get to that point, feel free to use the raise hand feature and that helps us keep the queue. So thanks so much. And over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. And thank you for pronouncing correctly my name. That's not very common. My Bonus points, right? That was good. <laughs> okay, let's share that. Okay, I, I hope you guys have seen these slides. Okay, so yeah, sure can. cool. Thank you. Good morning. And thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I'm very, very happy uh, to finally present my research to the Austrian Workshop community. Uh, I brought a, a presentation about this work that I have been doing with uh, Gustavo Torrens, Heterogeneous Effects of Liberal Institutions on Economic Development, the Role of Cultural Coherence with Formal Institutions. Uh, and this is the agenda for these uh, 15 minutes. First, I will do a summary on the most important parts of this research, and then we will talk some about the novelty of the findings and possible future developments. Uh, well, we need to start by disentangling some concepts here. By institutions, we mean only the public formal institutions, the legal framework enforced from international conventions to constitutions, laws, regulations, um, etc. Uh, culture would be the system of beliefs, values, and social norms that are widely shared by the generality of members of our community and are persistent in time. Here, what are usually called informal institutions would be considered to be inside culture. And uh, finally, cultural institutional coherence refers to the uh, matching between culture and institutions, how these formal institutions fit operationally and symbolically to the cultural environment in which they operate. Usually, uh, institutional economists focus on the co-evolution of culture and institutions, but often institutions and culture evolve through different mechanisms and are uh, subjected to different forces. And this can give rise to a mismatch between institutions and culture. A very common example uh, is the um, institutional transplant. Institutions design elsewhere that are directly transplanted to a different social environment. This mismatch can generate underperformance, incompliance, uh, open disobedience, and even violent contestation. As you probably know, many authors have claimed that institutions explain current comparative development, with liberal institutions being key for modern development. And it is not easy to provide a perfect definition for liberal institutions or liberal democracy, because these systems are materially quite heterogeneous across the globe, but they share certain 
core institutions. They are representative democracies with open and competitive elections, and they have mixed economies based on market mechanisms with a variable degree of public sector involvement. They allow the participation of broad sectors of the citizenry in the economic life and political decision making. Citizens can organize themselves in companies, political parties, and other civil associations to participate in economic, political, and social realms. There is official recognition of universal and equal individual liberties and rights, such as the freedom of association, of expression, um, universal suffrage, right to private property. And at least on the paper, uh, states aim to ensure in their procedures some basic principles such as impersonality, rule of law, equality before the law, transparency, etc. So in this institutional environment, economic development will rely a lot on individual initiative and the capacity of the individuals to organize and cooperate collectively. I think it is reasonable to say that this institutional environment would be more consistent, more coherent with cultures that encourage innovation, creativity, tolerance to individual independence, generalized morality, equality, cooperation, social participation. And in fact, these cultural traits have been associated theoretically and empirically to a better economic performance. Some popular traits, as you might know, are generalized trust, orientation towards public affairs, political engagement, associative participation, tolerance uh, towards individual independence, as I said before, and many, many others. And they are known to affect economic performance through different mechanisms. For instance, by improving collective action capacities, reducing transaction, transaction, transaction costs, stimulating entrepreneurship and innovation, improving the capacity to build and cooperate within large organizations. They also improve political performance, reducing corruption, promoting citizens' involvement, strengthening lead accountability, etc. So let's see if this is true. We took all the nations we could to do this table that you can see in the page uh, 11. Uh, here, here we show the different correlation between these cultural traits and development, depending on how liberal, how liberal the institutions of these nations are. We show two different indicators of liberalizations with similar results. Uh, let's see the first one, for instance, policy two. It ranges from minus 10 to 10, with 10 being full liberal democracy and minus 10 being authoritarian regime. We can see in, in green uh, that as institutions get more liberal, the correlation between these traits and economic development get, gets stronger and more significant. So these cultural traits are more capable to produce economic development in more liberal environments. And in authoritarian regimes, this relationship is not clear at all. These were simple correlations, but if we want to claim causality, things get more difficult because of this complex circulation of reverse causation. We resort to a single country analytical narrative to circumvent reverse causation and test the actual effect of culture on economic performance under liberal institutions. Or in other words, the heterogeneous effects of liberal institutions on economic performance. One of the benefits of using this single country narrative is that main public formal institutions are constant across the nation. So in the case of the Spanish regions, since they share the same main institutions today, there is no variability nor any differential effect coming from institutions because they are fixed. Now we can study the effect of these cultural traits within the same liberal institutions on economic development in, in the regions. So we, we use this case, the, the case of the Spanish regions. Uh, and here I show two maps about current culture and economic development in the Spanish provinces. On the left, we see an index called culture that uses information about interest in politics, participation in voluntary associations, generalized trust, and participation in alternative political actions like strikes, demonstrations, signing petitions, etc. The map on the right shows the provincial distribution of GDP per capita. In the two maps, um, the darker the higher. Uh, note that those places with the highest economic development are those with the highest cultural index. And in both cases, they are located in the northeastern part of Spain. We want to analyze the effect of these cultural traits on economic, on economic performance, but still there is this reverse causation that prevents us 
prevents us from um, observing causal effects. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, well, we can go to history and see what came first, right? Let's talk first about uh, the history of regional economic development in Spain. So we have here on the right, the regional economic distribution in the present, 2015, and on the left, the distribution two centuries ago in the year 1800. The distribution was very different with some regions of the South being the richest and some in the North being the poorest. Uh, now those rich regions of the South are among the poorest and some of the poorest regions in the North are now among the richest. The distribution that we see on the left was very stable and it was like that during centuries. But in the 19th century, something happened that triggered a transformation in the economic distribution. That transformation brought the geographic distribution that we see uh, on, the, on the right, on the map on the right. And it remained fairly unchanged from the 1930s. What happened between these two maps? What happened was the main inst institutional reforms of the transition from the ancient regime towards the liberal state. So we rule out the current distribution of economic, that the, the fact that the current distribution uh, of economic development is just a simple continuation of a historical economic di distribution. But now we have another problem we do not have information about the historical cultural traits in the regions. What we do have is information about the different political institutions in the distant past. They were different because the regions formed different kingdoms before the unification into present day Spain. And we have information about relevant institutions that have been found to be linked in the literature to the development of these cultural traits. So we are going to use some historical institutions as instrumental variables for culture. Um, the existence of municipal autonomy in the Middle Ages and constitutional and parliamentary constraints on the executive in the early, in the, in the early modern period. Uh, these institutional features were associated, as I said before, to the development of these cultural traits. And as you can see, these political experiences also occurred in the northeastern part of Spain. Uh, precisely where we find today the highest levels of culture of our cultural index. Now that we have these proxies, we could also see that uh, historical economic development was uncorrelated to historical culture, ruling out some alternative explanation. These new gray arrows you can, you can see here. Um, now we can see more feasible the analysis of our story. Our story is the one that is marked uh, with the red arrows. But if these cultural traits existed long time ago, why haven't they promoted economic development in the regions before the 1800s? Because they need liberal institutions to favor economic performance. They are consistent with the needs of the liberal environment, but not with the ancient regime. In the ancient regime, they couldn't operate. They couldn't promote economic development. But as Spain is getting more liberal, those regions with, with a higher presence of coherent cultural traits grow faster. So we need to demonstrate that all this story is true and robust. And in the manuscript, we analyze this phenomenon from different angles and use different techniques. The basic model to test this is uh, this two-stage least square regression. Uh, in the first stage, we regress culture on the historical political experiences that work as the instrumental variables. Uh, we can see that they have a positive and significant effect. In uh, the second stage, we regress this instrumented culture on the GDP per capita of the regions today. And we see that the effect is positive and also is highly significant. This coefficient means that one standard deviation more of this cultural indicator increases the GDP per capita of the provinces about 22%, which means around 7,000 euros, $8,000. Uh, in the manuscript, uh, you can see that these results are robust to the inclusion of relevant controls, including geography, uh, socioeconomic issues, etc. And if this phenomenon is true, we should be able to analyze it to analyze it in growth. So we performed a convergence analysis. Here we show the result of testing uh, beta convergence, but we did many other things. Uh, what we saw here is that there exists 
a double component in growth, a catch-up effect that forces convergence, and a coherence, what we call coherence effect that pulls for divergence. And what we observed in, with this um, convergence analysis is that, and you can see it in the manuscript, uh, is that in the periods of liberalization, the coherence effect was so powerful that the convergence process was completely extracted. And when there were authoritarian setbacks, the coherent effect was annulled or attenuated, and that brought about periods of high convergence. This part of the paper is actually very beautiful, I think. About the novelty of the findings. Some of the findings of this research uh, were already present in the mainstream literature. Uh, culture affects economic performance, check. Liberal institutions help to explain comparative economic development today, check. Historical experiences leave a long-lasting cultural legacy, check. Culture finds different matchings with different institutional frameworks. Mm, I think that this idea is not that novel. We could see this intuition in classical authors and in political science. Even this could be also be felt in some works within economics. But I feel that at least in mainstream economics, it was neglected uh, or not taken seriously. Here we found a strong evidence of it. And this means that we would do well to revisit some popular papers that talked about institutions and development alone and forgot about culture. I hope I was convincing in showing that cultural institutional coherence is very relevant in the understanding of economic development, but also that Spain is a good lab to study it. Uh, but um, to address a more in-depth analysis in Spain, we should improve several things. Mainly, we need a better cultural index with more indicators and less problems to get provincial aggregations. On the other hand, I think we need to find and show clear evidence of regional cultures in the past. At least some anecdotal evidence of the regional differences would make the reader feel more confident about the story. And with these, we could address many questions. For instance, how is the complete co cultural system that is coherent with the institutional framework of the liberal democracies? Because the cultural context that we talked about today is way wider than the four variables that we have shown here. We should identify all the elements of this cultural system, and then we should study how they interact. And are these elements uh, always together? Uh, which cultural traits are relevant for the performance of which liberal institutions or processes? How to develop this cultural system? Why do these regional cultural differences persist despite sharing today the same institutions? These cultural traits may liberal societies perform better, but why couldn't they do the same under the ancient regime? Would these traits work differently within a strong authoritarian regime than within a weak state that is absent in most of the jurisdiction? And very interesting, what are the cultural systems that are con co consistent or coherent with other regimes? And I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. That was brilliant. Um, and the queue, as you just see, is now open. And I think Jess might like to kick us off and then feel free. We'll, we'll take in questions and comments from there. So Jess, please feel free. Okay, can you hear me okay? My internet has been weird. Yes. Yep, okay. you're perfect. Um, okay, great, sorry. So I think this is incredibly ambitious and super fascinating. Um, and I really enjoyed hearing about it. I wish I'd had a chance to spend a little bit more time in the details of the paper in part because it makes me think of um, a particular paper that came out about two years ago now um, by, <clears throat> by um, Scott Page and Jenna Bednar that, argue, that uses a formal framework, it's an APSR paper, it uses a formal framework to say that the sort of order of institutions matters for their performance because of behavioral spillovers across them. And they use culture as a way of measuring the extent to which um, though the extent to which like essentially uh, you essentially you learn differently from past institutions right so that you have different spillovers based on some sort of cultural dimension which then led, led me to sort of a potential competing hypothesis for you which is you know your instrumental variable is about subnational variation in historical institutions yes 
Yes. And so the question is, is do we know, so yes, these cultural traits pers persist over a long period of time, right? But how do we know that it's not also the case that it's the specific ordering of a particular historical institution and then the economic liberal reforms that you discuss that leads to the different long-term, the, the different GDP per capita performance at the subnational level. So you, it seems to me you're suggesting, right, that historical institutions lead to some sort of cultural tendencies, which are essentially activated or translated in G, into GDP per, uh, per capita growth through economic liberal reforms, if I understand the argument. And so my question is, how do we know that it's the cultural traits that are doing the work instead of the specific ordering of the historical institutional context and then the economic liberal reform? Does that make sense? I, I, I don't know what is the competing variable you are, I couldn't understand properly, the, the competing variable you are saying. You, you mean like, uh, in, institutions that are subnational that somehow tran, uh, transcend the, 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 the unification, like they show now variability regionally, institutions, former institutions? No, that essentially what, it seems to me what you're saying is that like essentially these historical institutions that vary subnationally shape culture, which is then essentially allows economic liberal reforms to work, right, yes. in different ways, right? Okay. That's your argument. Yes. But if the instrumental variable is this variation in historical institutions, yeah. could it not be the case that culture is not doing very much work for us at all? And that instead, it is the unique ordering of the historical institution that is actually acting as your instrumental variable, and then the economic liberal reform, however many years later, what, what that produces the outcome itself. What do you mean by unique ordering? Um, that had a different institution um, that, so you, um, and, and again, I'm not sure exactly off the top of my head exactly what the nature of the variation was in the instrumental variable, right? Like whether it was, I think it was more authoritarian or less, right? But whether, whether it's less about the culture that's doing the work and more about the fact that one institution, one historical institution came before the next one, and that if it had been a different historical institution that preceded the economic liberal reforms, you would get a different realization of GDP per capita growth. That's very interesting. Yeah, I would it's think essentially about it's that. a path dependence argument that doesn't rely on culture. And so I'm just curious as to whether it factors in. Um, you may not need to answer it now. It's just something that came to me by thinking back to this previous paper by Bednar and Page that might be worth taking a quick look at. So I'll just, I'll leave uh, No, no, but I, I really, because uh, if, if I understood what you, what you mean, I think we have ways of, um, of testing that because there are kingdoms and um, there are some, um, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I will, I, will, I will think about that. But yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll send that's you a, a citation great... of the paper and you can decide yes, if it's relevant yes. or not. Yes, yes, yes. Thank I you think Dan much. might have just put a link in the chat box, um, Jess, to that paper. So you can see if, that's, uh, if that works for you. Ah, cool. Yeah. But no, great points wow. all around, Jess. Yeah, a lot, a lot to digest. <laughs> so don't feel like you have to do all that now. <laughs> Um, yeah. Can I, no, can I yeah, add something yeah. there? Yeah. So, so just just one thing. I, I like the idea of the order that Jess is is um, is um, suggesting. Uh, um, well, then we can discuss uh, David if we if we can do something with the data. But something I think is important to remark is that all these historical institutions um, do so. All the formal versions are gone. And they, so essentially part of what the liberal reform did is to essentially destroy all those institutions um, to some extent and unify some of, the, of those institutions. Uh, but again, maybe there is some room to explore if there is some kind of dependence you know, I don't know, on, on those institutions at the regional level. No? But um, again, those those places that didn't have autonomy 
uh, in the in the Middle Ages, well, now they have the the, the, the level of autonomy that you have uh, across Spain. No? So essentially, um, again, somehow, I think it's interesting what you are saying, but we also have to think more carefully if we are controlling for that or not. And to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, there, are, there are some And it might just come down to how you're defining culture there too, right? Like whether yes. it's very mm -hmm. fundamentally different from the way they're talking about or whether there is actually the similar mechanism at work, at which point then it's just a small citation you add in. Yes. I'm remembering Vincent's remarks, but how do we define the state? <laughs> so we should spend the next half an hour around defining culture. I, I was just really curious, um, guys, and uh, guys, the, the, the queue is open, and Claudia, let's turn to you um, um, in, just, in just one quick second, but could you maybe just speak really quickly, David, to, to kind of the, like the journal audience, or is this more of a book project that you have in mind? Because it, it's so ambitious, and I'm just kind of wondering where, where you plan on taking it. That might help kind of situate our discussion a little bit, and then we'll turn to Claudia. Yeah, in the short term, I think we are gonna send it to a, to a journal, uh, but I think this topic is very broad and uh, it well deserves uh, a broader um, content. I mean, like uh, a book and cool. because also I'm interested on, on, on this, uh, on researching about this and, and probably it's a project of um, some more years because uh, yeah, on, or, or a, a chain of different journal, I mean, journal papers because yeah, it's very, it's very broad. And, oh. uh, yeah. and I think it's under understudied. I don't know. Mm -hmm. like, it's a very re reasonable uh, mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. No, I was just curious. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And then, uh, then we'll turn to, uh, to Claudia and then Brian after that. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, David and Gustavo for the excellent paper. And I was wondering whether there were any particular external shocks that might have affected those municipalities that had a particular set of institutions, either whether they had a more, a, a, how can I say, the autonomy, were they also a, a, a facing particular external shocks that you could have taken into account? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, they are originated uh, by the process um, of their Christian, as they call, reconquest, which goes from the north to the to the south, mm -hmm. and um, at the beginning of the and this process is like seven hundred years, and at the beginning of the um, of the reconquest, the, it's like the Christian the Christian uh, elites are like they they took shelter on the north and they start war from the north to the south. They are pushing the, the, the Muslims back to the south. And uh, at the beginning of this, all, all this, um, uh, this war, um, the Christian elites were very, very weak. And um, so what they offer, they, and they, as they were advancing in the war, they needed to uh, consolidate the new positions and repopulate all, those area, uh, all that area. But it was not difficult, not uh, easy because they didn't have the resources to bring all these people there. So they had to offer better institutional arrangements to uh, the people who uh, were to be the new repopulators there. So they offered um, political, um, better uh, civil rights and economic rights and political rights, basically just to make a summary. But as the war was progressing toward the South, the elites were getting more power, gathering more power, and they had the resources to bring people, and also they found people, uh, so they didn't need to repopulate, uh, or they didn't, they didn't need to offer these very advantageous uh, institutional right, I mean, institutional arrangements. And uh, they established different kinds of um, uh, civilizations, let's say. It's like a colonization process. And they established like in, uh, inclusive institutions there. And in the South, the, 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 the hierarchy, the, the, the society was way more hierarchical with a, a, a less dispersed, uh, with a concentration of 
uh, economic resources, land, and a political power. So it was this process and the, the, the needs of the elites and the power of the elites, the balance of power between the elites and the population, which we, 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 what uh, brought about the different institutional arrangements in the North and in the South. I don't know if more or less this is something that you are, what you are looking for. Okay. Thank you, thank you, David. And thank you, Claudia. It's good to see you. Um, and then, uh, then we'll do Brian and then Renzo. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about implications for now. Uh, what insights? Yeah. So in a sense, I find this frustrating. It reminds me a little bit of Putnam's work on social capital in Italy. And yeah. like, at least that book, it was a little better in later work. It's like, well, what can you do? Well, just don't get invaded by the Normans in the 11th century. <laughs> Otherwise, you're doomed. Um, so if you could maybe say something about what this means, especially if you're a citizen or a political entrepreneur now in an area that doesn't happen to have this favorable culture. Yeah, uh, well, that's a that wonderful question. Well, I have intuitions about that, but I think um, we, we need more, uh, more research about, and also probably social experiment, uh, experimentation about how to develop this system that is more coherent with uh, our kind of favorite institutional system, which is the neoliberal system. Um, my intuition is that you can only develop the um, beliefs and values and social norms of democracy by practicing democracy. When you are in the, so this is what somehow happened is like, the, these, these institutions in the past were more liberal. And so since people had to interact in this more liberal environment with a, um, a space of freedom and rights and equality in which they have to organize and they have uh, the right and the necessity to self-organize uh, is where or when you develop all these um, necessary traits, cultural traits and social norms to um, live in, in that life. Um, but the thing is, if now we are all sharing these liberal institutions, why we are not somehow converging to the same cultural system? So that's uh, what, 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 what there was in the past that it is not now, it is a matter of um, time and uh, you can never catch up because they are like uh, accumulating more, right? Uh, some, some authors like Person and Tabellini, they did this this work called um, cultural capital. It's like you are accumulating the, the, the knowledge about and the culture to uh, use democratic, democratic um, and institutions, right? Um, I think that um, I'm a bit like more um, not pessimistic, but um, I think that is not like a matter of time. I think it's a matter of content as well. Um, in the, in the, um, I'm just thinking the medieval, uh, north, northern Spain, Castile, and, and so on. Uh, in the municipalities, the people had way more power uh, of decision making, political decision making, on their lives than they have now. We we have now um, representative democracy. You can choose, uh, you have a, a menu of political parties and they will decide for you and they will tell you whatever in order they use marketing or whatever. But there you need to know, you, you, you need to know about the matter. You need to, to know, uh, um, you voted about the um, uh, budget things, uh, some legal issues that, are, that were very, um, uh, I mean, very, with dramatic consequences. So I don't know if that uh, democracy was different in those places. So I don't know if it is the, the scope of the matters that we can decide what forces the people to develop these traits. But also I, I would feel very anxious in that society in which you have to decide now again if about gay marriage or, or, or human rights or things like that. Like, I mean, it's like, we are still we, have, we need to re revise those things. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it's a different direction with your work on digital depression or repression. It's also depressing. <laughs> yeah. 
Jess and otherwise. Um, but no, that's great. I did look, look find earlier today that the temporal paradox has apparently been solved by a team of researchers. So we could go back in time and make some changes without actually running into too many problems. So <laughs> let's consider that plan B. Um, Renzo, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, David and Gustavo. Uh, really, really interesting uh, paper and, and uh, presentation, of course. Um, my question was about your culture, uh, the way you measure culture, cultural traits. So you're using these ver four variables, interest in politics, uh, generalized interpersonal trust, uh, tendency to participate in voluntary civil organizations and engaging in unconventional political actions. Um, to me, that sounds more like civic engagement rather than measuring mm -hmm. culture. So I was wondering, and, and, and of course, uh, like Ryan mentioned, it's more of what Putnam is uh, assessing, social capital, civic engagement, mm -hmm. as opposed to making a general statement about culture actually uh, being what's, what's uh, captured in, in this uh, evaluation and how it's actually affecting performance. So um, I wonder if you've thought about that um, because it's, um, I would say it's a bit, rather big statement to say that these four variables actually capture culture uh, and a society's mm -hmm. culture and its diversity, mm -hmm. um, which is quite complex. It has many different dimensions, as we all know. So um, I'm, 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 my, my understanding is that you're actually measuring civic engagement more okay. explicitly rather than culture through your indices, so through your cultural trade index. So. I just uh, was wondering uh, if you thought about that and if um, and if you would uh, or why you would think that these four variables would be measuring culture instead. Mm -hmm. you. Yeah, you are you are completely right. Uh, the thing is that uh, these are all the variables that we could gather at this level of aggregation. And why do we have this um, variables that are more linked to civic engagement. It is because it, they are, I mean, these um, surveys are made by the Sociological Research Center of Spain. So they are always, these are actually are political um, surveys. And what we, our assumption is that um, what, what is behind all these things are cultural 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 traits so this is why we are using and yeah of course uh, social capital because one why one of the reasons why we like uh, social capital is because they, it works very well in in liberal liberal societies not that much on in in very authoritarian author, uh, authoritarian regimes and um, basically in order to um, to, uh, for the understanding, um, the culture that we are thinking of is social capital, and this is our main literature, and also um, um, the literature of uh, political culture as well. And then there is there are these new kind of new um, set of cultural variables that talk about um, individualistic um, versus collective collective cultures. Uh, so we, they all belong to the same new uh, literature that talks about culture and economics. And they usually put together social capital and individualistic values. Uh, I don't know if the name is appropriate, individualistic actually. But, but yeah, you were right on your concern. But we, we assume that culture is be, be behind civic engagement and these uh, particular things items, interest in politics, participation in voluntary associations, generalized trust and participation in unconventional political actions. Uh, thank so you very if, much, Renzo. If I could uh, just add, yeah, of course, uh, you would think that behind these uh, patterns of social behavior, uh, there is some cultural backup, but um, also, I don't know if uh, the number of years you capture might be reflecting, as Claudia was mentioning, some exogenous context or event that might be leading them to responding that way. So are, there more, are they more likely to be interested in politics because something occurring between 2015 and 2019, mm -hmm. as opposed to more like a long-term pattern of behavior 
or trust um, is that a response of culture or some particular event that has led them to be more likely to trust each other or trust them less, trust each other less. So um, I think um, maybe exploring that a little bit could, could help or discussing that a little bit could help uh, in, in the paper um, to clarify this um, big idea of capturing culture through four variables. Um, so it's just a Thank you very much. Thought. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's a very reasonable concern. Actually, uh, this survey is being done, or some of these um, questions have been done from the year 2000, 1999, 1998, something like that. And they show certain, I mean, regionally, these patterns um, are fairly stable. So it's very common that these places in the north eastern part of Spain, they show more generalized trust, which, uh, what, what is behind generalized trust? Well, generalized morality, which is different than uh, restricted morality. Like, uh, I don't know if you are fa uh, fam uh, familiarized with this, with this literature, but um, uh, I don't know if I should, I should talk a lot about this, but uh, it's very, very, um, in, my, in my opinion, very uh, illustrating. Um, for example, Tabellini, Banfield, and some other authors talked about the difference between generalized morality and restricted morality. Generalized morality is that you, in, within your community or um, universally, you um, think that all the members of the community deserve ethical consideration. So you behave ethically uh, with them. But there is this other society in which morality is more restricted, like what they call a moral, a moral familyism, which means that uh, you are only moral within your family. And when you cross the border of your family, uh, you are not ethical anymore. You, the people do not deserve any ethical consideration, so you behave opportunistically. Uh, it is very difficult that you show generalized trust in these indicators, if you live in a society uh, that shows a moral uh, familyism in which people are opportunistic to each other all the time. So this is why I think that it, this behavior or this um, answer to this question uh, reveals some kind of cultural pattern. I don't know if this helps, but uh, anyways, your concern is, is well taken. Yeah, thank you very much. I, we, we, will, we will do uh, we will spend more time on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, and Jamie also had a good point in the chat box there too. I'm not sure if you wanted to expand on that at all, um, Jamie, but she was kind of talking about another uh, recent book that's coming out looking at the experience of Italy. Actually, it's not a recent book. It's not uh, a recent one. Here. Yeah. It's about oh, applying the Ostroms. Yeah. So Sabethi, uh, I'm just, I'm just getting to know the work right now. So, um, but uh, I, I've spoken with Sabetti's co-author, Rosalino, and Rosalino told me about his dissertation, and he was basically sort of, you know, very, very diplomatically countering Putnam by suggesting that in Sis right, so the argument in Italy anyways, is that the northern community, like the north was more successful because it had a certain governmental structure rather than in the south. And what Rosalino was, was looking into was the disintegration of institutions. Um, and I would even argue just that trust also became an issue in Sicily as well because they were just taxed so heavily like and so they couldn't like you couldn't tell your neighbor that you bought a cow because you'd be taxed on it. And so we know from the Ostrom's work that trust is a really important aspect of this conversation as well. So yeah, be sure to check out Sabetti and, and, and Candela's work. Um, but I had another question too. So I think about these things in the term of like uh, actual legitimate actual cultural capital because I'm a musicologist and so I thought about these questions in terms of like the art side of things um so we deal with the ideas of nationalism nationalism is like when a nation unifies like Italy or like what we're seeing in Spain theoretically it's supposed to make everything the same in that in that country and what we see in Italy is things weren't the same like the north prospered and the south didn't and I'm seeing that in your work as well, that, um, that we see these centers of prosperity shifting. And so does your work suggest that nationalism failed? Uh, failed. I think, 
about nationalism, I think it's parallel somehow. I don't know. I, I, I actually, I, we, we don't touch that, that topic, but this, that's very interesting. Um, that's very interesting. Um, in fact, I think nationalism can have problems to, um, to promote convergence. I mean, economically, I mean, that the regions can catch up. I think they, um, because they, they want the same uh, institutional structure as uh, everywhere, and maybe um, different regions should deserve different arrangements and self-organize and things like that. So I, I don't know, that's my, my immediate thought right now, but now I disagree with myself right now. <laughs> Sorry, this is, I, I, I need to um, think more about that, but this is a great question. Thank you very much. It's okay. I threw a hard question out there. Um, so it's funny to hear you <laughs> think great. out loud and like, yeah. Oh, I can't wait much. to see you come up with that, you know, you and, and uh, Gustavo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is the market of a good yeah. room. This is what you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gustavo, yeah, sorry, please. You know, one thing is that, um, remember that we are always interested in the uh, distribution of economic activity across regions. So overall, the liberal reforms were positive for pretty much everybody. The problem is that some regions uh, that started relatively rich end up being like prospering a lot, taking advantage a lot of these reforms, and others taking advantage like lower, and then this produce some kind of reversal of fortune, if you want. Um, but uh, again, I, I, I don't know the details of the case of Italy, but probably this could be more or less the same. So some reforms in Italy, they were good for everybody, but the North essentially grew much more than the South. So we're all good for everybody, but this changed the uh, regional distribution. No? So uh, our well, I will always interest in, so essentially our outcome variables put uh, 100 uh, and then if you are uh, above 100, below 100, it's everything relative, no? So uh, we are trying to explain the, the distribution rather than the average of the whole country, no? That's right. Mm -hmm. No, that's helpful. And I think one thing you're hearing is just a push for greater specificity, perhaps, right? And kind of digging down into specific kind of metrics of culture. And Jess, I thought that was a good point you had on, on kind of that score in the chat box. I'm not sure if you wanted to expand on that at all. I was mostly, I was reflecting on Renzo's point, which was, you know, um, given like all of the ongoing debates we have about what should and shouldn't be included and in what culture is, I wonder if this is an opportunity to make a more forceful argument about the specific dimensions of culture that you are arguing matter. So, and then specifically how they translate into behavior, right? Because you have this really wonderfully fascinating overarching story about how they are meant to make economic reforms more effective, right? Based on the sort of cultural tendencies of the sub-regional or the sub-national group. Um, and I'm curious as to whether you have space or interest to delve into those two dimensions, right? So you're constraining why you're talking about what you're talking about when it comes to culture and making an argument about why that is, and then also making a sort of more forceful statement about the translation of that culture into actual behavioral outcomes um, for your GDP growth variable, which you know, again, like I wanted to take a deeper look into the paper. So feel free to say, oh, we did that like very well on this page and I missed it. But, um, <laughs> but I think that would be, <laughs> that would be, um, I feel like that would also sort of like really push against a lot of the feedback you're getting of like, oh, culture is so broad and it's so complex. And, um, and, you know, I feel like those are, those are valid and also really common problems with these kinds of papers. And so I feel like there's a cool opportunity here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. Actually, we we haven't covered that in the paper, and um, this is somehow this is like we are opening the door. Uh, well, this is how I feel at least. It's like we are opening the door. Like, hey, come to Spain and, and study all these things because we have a perfect lab to a lab to to study all these things. And yeah, the 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 difference between having the culture or knowing the the right answer in the in the survey and then materialize it into behavior that's way different it's very common that they feel that they are very interested in politics and they follow politics but they then don't vote they don't vote 
or, or things like that. Or they, they say, it's very common, they say, uh, tolerance is very important. 90% of Spaniards say that mm, tolerance is very important all over the, but then we talk about immigration. We talk about that and they are not that tolerant. So they know the right answers, but anyways, I don't know. Um, so far with the tools that we have, we have like different puzzle, uh, piece, uh, pieces of a puzzle. Of, of course, not enough, but somehow this theory, this, this hypothesis makes sense with all the, with the, the, the few pieces that we have. And uh, yeah, I think this is, this is a great future development, like trying to see, yeah, okay, we have this culture, but what kind of culture actually behave as they think, or they are consistent with their own values. That's great contribution, thanks a lot. No, thanks. And, and Jamie, we had a kind of a two finger um, interjection there as well. Jamie, please feel free. Yeah, just real quick. I just want to say I'm, I'm actually really excited about your paper too, because of all the opportunities you're opening up. It's always hard to be innovative, right? Because you end up with more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. But what I'm seeing so far is like the data you're finding um, is really challenging some of our, the notions that we've held for a long time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see um, now how we can apply that and like look at some of our old ideas again and maybe reframe things. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Can, can I make a comment related oh, oh, to Chess yeah. point? So I, again, I, I, I'm not sure that I will be answering your question, but something I'm thinking while you are um, talking Chess is that, um, so, Something that we try uh, in, in one of these robustness checks that we did, that we, and we did so many, is that try to control for some variable that try to capture um, uh, something related to the evolution of institutions. No? And I think we have um, uh, this, um, uh, this variable related to uh, the, the inequality in the, um, in the 19th century, correct me if I'm wrong, David, uh, or some something that would tell you, hey, in the middle of this transition in the 19th century, uh, what were your, um, your local institutions? You are, you are more a, an equal society, or more equal society, how land was distributed, okay? And then uh, our effects persist after controlling for those variables. So it seems that there is some other channel um, that, um, you know, we, we try to convince the reader this is kind of a cultural challenge, but well, maybe, maybe it's, it, it, it's something else, even after controlling for those, uh, for, for that institutional, uh, potential institutional variation in the key moment in this uh, 19th century when all the transformations started happening at the national level, no? So, um, kind of we are, we are allowing the possibility of the alternative, more kind of Engerman and Sokolow uh, style of uh, institutional explanation related to factor endowments and that type of things. And our story persists there in the data even after controlling for that. So, um, and well, David did a lot trying to convince me because I was always pushing him, no, no, no. This must be that there was something else there. And that David was always coming with a, a new robustness check saying, no, look at this, Mr. I am controlling for that. And then uh, still uh, the cultural channel that seems to be, seems to be there, no? But again, I think we really need to think more carefully about the type of, of comments that you and Renzo are, 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 are making, okay? So very, thank you very much for those comments. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, and we just have a couple minutes left here. So I'm not sure if anybody else had final points they'd like to make. And, and otherwise, we can do kind of a quick summary and kind of reflection from you guys. Oh, maybe. Oh, Renzo, did you have one more you'd like to jump in on? Please feel free if so. Yes, thank you, uh, Scott. So yeah, sort of related to my previous comment and, and, and Jess's comment too. Um, but I was, as I was also reading, rereading through the paper, sort of implicit in the argument is that there are particular cultural traits that will lead to um, economic success at the country level or in particular regions. Um, and, and that's 
that's also that leads to another point that there the cultures that are not as developed they so so the countries or the countries that are not as performing uh, or not performing well economically is because they are they have cultural values and cultural traits that are uh, sort of backward um, and that's sort of my understanding from from reading it uh, that that's part of the statement not explicit but could be implicit I know you're not saying that but uh, part of the reading of the argument uh, implicitly is saying that uh, these civic engagement traits that are part of the culture are more likely to make uh, countries and particular regions more successful economically, measured in GDP per capita. Um, but as, as we were discussing already, it's not culture is a mixture of things, um, and and you could also have poverty levels, inequality levels that are part of specific contexts that are influencing how they end up building their understanding of the environment and building these as habits and making them ultimately as cultural traits. Um, so maybe it's not culture, but it's a context that in which you find unequal distribution of assets, uh, unequal access to opportunities that might be reflected through culture, but it's not mm -hmm. culture, it's, mm -hmm. it's an yeah. unequal, unequal environment. Um, so that. maybe also thinking about something similar to that and the implicit argument that could be read uh, mistakenly by others. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know you're not making that argument, uh, but it, some people might read it that way. Um, so maybe just um, taking a, a look at that might, might also help. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Maybe, maybe sometimes, um, yeah, by inertia, we do that. But we, we just say that this, is a, this matters even in presence or controlling by alternative explanations or some other powerful forces that are actually operating. But this mm, force is always operating. Cultural, uh, cultural traits and the matching with the, uh, with the liberal institutions is, is operating uh, for sure. And uh, regarding these other cultural context, the other variables of the cultural context like uh, inequality, uh, I think uh, inequality is also operating mm -hmm. uh, the distribution of assets. Uh, but we control for that. And still our, there is a, a significant and robust um, effect from culture to economic development. Excellent. And the other mechanisms, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Oh no, it's okay. No, uh, yeah, uh, and also the mechanisms we there are they are very um, uh, they are very wide. This is like when we talk about we are talking about culture, but we could be talking about transaction costs, and this is like we it is very difficult to to arrive to all the uh, aspects of material life in which they can uh, materialize. You know. Well, thank you both so much again. That was just fantastic. I got a round of applause for David and good job, of course, as well. Really, really well done, guys. Um, thank yeah, you very as, much, guys. as just said there, we, can't all, we all can't wait to see where it goes. I think it's a really, really ambitious, timely, and important project. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll put, there's a little link in the chat box there. That's just to kind of a, a comparative economic development one that I did a couple of years ago. It was more focused on Indonesia and South Africa, but there might be a couple of, you know, useful takeaways um, looking at Spain. So just for what it's worth. Um, oh, thanks guys. Oh yeah, no worries. No worries at all. Guys looking ahead. Remember we have Christy Anderson. Uh, it's going to be a really great discussion on regulatory um, institutions, immigration and genetification on Wednesday. It's a big week for the workshop. As you guys know, Thursday, we have our ocean Memorial lecture with Frank Lairhoven. Remember to register if you haven't already. And of course, Friday morning, um, we have our Governing the Commons 30 Years Later conference, which, gosh, the last time David updated me, I think we were at over 1,200 or something registrations already. So it's fantastic. That's going to be a wonderful lineup that goes that nine to 1,200. Oh, there you go. Thank you, David. Awesome. <laughs> so remember, and, and as we say, they're not all Russian bots. So we're, we're really excited. <laughs> we recognize a lot of the names. Um, so please um, join us for that. Let us know if you have any questions um, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys again. In other words, very soon. Thanks again to David and Gustavo. Have a wonderful rest of the afternoon, everybody. Much appreciated. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.